So moving on to question number 68. Question number 68 is again an image based question but the question text is giving you all the necessary hints. Identify the lesion demonstrated in the picture. It is there on the shins. There in someone who is a diabetic. He or she has neuropathy. He or she has reti. No pethy. Clear? Clear? Tell me the answer. Tell me the answer. The answer is I will. Okay, look at the image. What does the image tell you? The image gives you a yellow brown plaque with the skin being so atrophic that you have blood vessels visible on it and it is present on the shins. Sometime later it can even break down to form ulcers. This is the typical description of something which is called as necrobiosis lipoidica diabeticorum seen in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes mellitus generally present on the shin as yellow brown plaque with surface atrophy telangiectasias over a period of time it can break down to form ulcers which are chronic non-healing may or may not be painful depending upon the uh, neuropathy that the patient has then and once they appear when this NBL appears there is no effect of controlling your glucose levels. You have to control them for this to not appear. Once it appears, obviously you should have glycemic control, but that does not affect the further nature of the disease duration. This is necrobiosis lipoidica diabeti corum. Correct? You all get this picture? Is this erythema? No. Is this acanthosis nigricans? These are hyperpigmented velvety plaques generally on the neck and the flexure alias. These can also be associated with diabetes, metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, but they are present in the neck or the flexures as hyperpigmented velvety plaque. Granuloma annulare are multiple skin colored beaded papules present in annular distribution. So you have these papules which are present in a ring like pattern. This is also associated with diabetes mellitus but this is skin colored and asymptomatic. So this is not granuloma annulare, this is this. Clear to everyone? Good. What is the spot diagnosis? Look at this image here. What is the spot diagnosis. What do you see here? You see that there is a zone of depigmentation on the hair. Otherwise this looks like coppery pigmentation in a colored pig. Coppery pigmentation at intervals on the hair. This is called as the flag sign flag sign is seen in washi orker right this is the flag sign this is seen in quo she or kar correct yes or no no yes zinc we have read is acrodermatitis and teropathica thymine causes beriberi -beri seen in alcoholics predominantly cns symptoms Fungal infection causes patchy hair loss. Doesn't look like this. 
this is typical of quasi-orchid. Clear everyone? Good question because it tests whether you know that the flag sign is seen here or not. Moving on to the next one. All are true about the image shown except. So what does the image show? What does the image show? Should I move here? Yes, I will move here. So what does the image show? Tell me. I will write the typical description of this because the image is so typical. This is an erythematous boggy swelling. Then it has pustules over it. It has hair loss over it and if I try to put pull the hair easily pluckable hair. Rhythm it is boggy swelling then if I touch it it is relatively painless. What is the diagnosis? Tell me the diagnosis. Erythematous boggy swelling with pustules, hair loss, easy pluckable hair, relatively painless associated with occipital lymph node. What is the diagnosis? Diagnosis is Kirio. Diagnosis is Kirion. What is Kirion? Kirion is a type of inflammatory tenia capitis. This is a type of inflammatory tenia capitis. All are true except sparse hair, yes. Associated with lymphadenopathy, yes. KH mound will show pseudo hyphae. No, KOH mount will not show pseudo hyphae. It will show proper hyphae. No, this will not show pseudo hyphae. This will show. Yes, depending if microsporum species is causing it, then it can show fluorescence all. So, So the answer is C. Answer is C. What are the other types of tenia capitis? There are some other types which is the grey patch. This is called, this is caused by microsporum. This is the type of ectothorax. Then there is another type which is called as the black dot. This is caused by the trichophyton. This is a type of endothrix. And one more you should know that is favus. Favus is caused by trichophyton. Sean Lo line. Okay. This is all that you need to know about tinea capitis. And treatment is with griseofulvin, turbinafin or itraconazole. There is no role of solo topical treatment. Clear? Clear everyone? Question number 
this is talking about a 60 year old woman a 60 year old woman so yes let's read this question together what is this question this question is that of a 60 year old woman who has the skin lesion history of radiation treatment which of the following is true first you tell me what the image shows what is the image telling you image is telling you that there is an ulcer with crusting and there is some scarring in the lesion this is one and this is two so one is the ulcer two is the scarring and three there is history of radiation what is the diagnosis what is the diagnosis so the diagnosis here is margulins the diagnosis here is so this is the diagnosis of margulins ulcer which happens in a long standing radiation or a scar or chronic osteomyelitis all these causes where there is a scar and altered immune milieu of the region there there is a chance of this ulcer happening what exactly is margulins ulcer margulins ulcer is squamous cell carcinoma clear margulins ulcer is squamous cell carcinoma how does this spread margulins ulcer is squamous cell carcinoma this met stasizes through lymph nodes this is very malignant more than the usual scc and in the treatment either you remove it or you do chemotherapy radiation doesn't have much role in it so this is your margulins ulcer now let's read it which of the following is true it is more malignant than basal cell carcinoma yes it metastasizes very rapidly more frequently it brunets no role with brunets rarely metastasizes to regional lymph nodes no very commonly metastasizes to regional lymph nodes should be treated by radiation therapy no i told you that it is only surgery and chemotherapy that you give here there is no role of radiation because radiation is also a causative organism so it can further make it more malignant so there is no role of radiation therapy it is more common in the whites not in the brunettes and it metastasizes through regional so which is true true is only this option clear to everyone yes the image is clear this is how the image will be in the exam also right so moving on to question number 72 wow a very long question take a few seconds read it then we'll do it together Six months duration, papule, thick adherent scale, border and scar, and there has been no improvement with the use of topical glucocorticoids. What is the best treatment? What is the best treatment here? what is the diagnosis look at what the image tells you the image tells you that there is a plaque which has central erythematous 
to be pigmented scarring then this has a hyperpigmented margin questions tell you that this has thick adherent scale tell me the diagnosis and the fact that this is on a photo exposed site tell me the diagnosis central erythematous depigmented scarring with a marginal hyperpigmentation with thick adherent scale on photo exposed site what is the diagnosis the diagnosis is d l e what is d l e it is discoid lupus eridi me to sus it is discoid lupus eridi me to sus that is the diagnosis what is this thick adherent scale give you this gives you the sign which is called as the tintac sign what is the treatment for this the treatment for this is treatment for this is first line is topical steroids if the patient does not respond to topical steroids then you go to oral hc qs which is hydroxy chloro queen that is the amino quinoline anti malaria so the next treatment of choice after this is hydroxy chloroquine azathioprine doesn't have much role systemic steroids doesn't have much role vitamin e has no role only thing is you have to make the diagnosis typical lesion of dle how typical can it be exactly this image i would have shown you had i been teaching you exactly this description just run your mind a bit not vitiligo please don't take it as vitiligo vitiligo does not have scaling even if in the image it looks like vitiligo to you read the text it does not have a thick adherent scale does not start as a red papule so please don't confuse it as vitiligo the answer here is dle treatment for which is hcqs clear so we move on to the next question what is this next question again a pretty long one just go through it and then we discuss it read the diagnosis yes tell me the answer very easy one we have already discussed it patient picture presents with a 6 hour history of fever purple spots buttocks and legs rash spreads rapidly patient is now obtunded what is the diagnosis tell me what is the diagnosis a simple one if you know how it looks like
टेल मी बताओ बताओ भाई जस्ट दिस व्हाट इज द क्वेश्चन टेल्स यू द क्वेश्चन टेल्स यू दैट देयर इज फीवर प्लस वॉमिटिंग प्लस फीलिंग पुअर राइट देन सडनली पेशेंट स्टार्ट हैविंग दीज पर्पल स्पॉट्स विच स्प्रेड वेरी रैपिडली एंड द पेशेंट इज ऑप्टेंडेड मीन्स पेशेंट इज वेरी सिक वॉट इज द डायग्नोसिस is this steven johnson syndrome no there is no history of drug so this is not a drug rash toxic shock syndrome caused by staph aureus no that generally does not have vomiting and all this meningococcemia definitely this is how meningococcemia presents like the diagnosis here is actually the diagnosis here the diagnosis is purpura fulminans the diagnosis is purpura fulminans where there is a lot of necrosis plus purpura happening what are the important causes the most common causes are one menjo coxemia to sepsis so these are the most important causes of menjo of purpura fulminans here with the option having menjo coxemia i will most definitely mark this as the answer so please see please see the diagnosis it itself mentions that there are purpuric lesions so if purpuric lesions are there please notice that this is meningococcemia which is purpura fulminans clear yes no very good not leptospirosis that does not look like this clear to everyone good should we move on to the next question yes this is again an image based question what does this show you this shows you an erythematous scaly plaque on the buttock the diagnosis mostly points towards the very simple one which is psoriasis so an erythematous scaly plaque silvery white scaling the answer for this is psoriasis as the diagnosis now that we have made the diagnosis we move on to the options can it cause premature coronary artery syndrome yes this is actually a systemic inflammatory disease that is the newest concept of psoriasis so this is a systemic inflammatory disease it can cause atherosclerosis due to the systemic inflammation this atherosclerosis can cause your coronary artery disease then can it cause arthritis yes it causes the zero negative psoriatic arthritis can it be itching if you ask me generally psoriasis is non itchy patients don't complain of itching but sometimes itching can be there so the answer is all of the above important point to remember is 
coronary artery disease. Psoriasis is a systemic inflammatory disease. Now it is known that it just does not involve the skin only. It causes inflammation in the entire body. Systemic inflammatory disease, which is why if you give methotrexate, it is good because methotrexate is an immunosuppressive. It will not only decrease the inflammation in the skin, it will also decrease the inflammation in the body. So giving methotrexate is also protective against the coronary artery disease in these patients. Identify the picture. Picture is a very, very, very typical lesion of psoriasis. Rest obviously you know. Clear? We move on to the next question. See, what is the answer for this one? What is the answer to this one? Photodynamic therapy is effective in all except. Photodynamic therapy is effective. What is photodynamic therapy? Photodynamic therapy, as the name suggests, you put a topical photosensitizer. You can also take it orally. Then you expose the patient to light. This will kill the cell. This works on the same principle as Soralane's except that it is slightly more advanced. Okay. Right. So this is Photodynamic therapy, very good for extensive superficial BCC. You give oral photosensitizer, photosensitizer plus you give light. Patient will respond. Actinic keratosis, very good. Patient will respond. Bowen's disease, patient will respond. But radiation treatment for advanced SCC, that has already spread. Advanced SC has already spread to systemic organs. Once it has spread to systemic organs, there is no role of giving any light treatment because light cannot penetrate the skin. It will not go inside the body and treat the lymphatic uh, organs that have been uh, metastasized with SCC. There is no role of this photodynamic therapy in such cases. It is good for your pre-malignant skin lesions and it is good for BCC but not for advanced SCC. Clear to everyone? Do you know it? This is a good question because you don't know much about photodynamic therapy. Please remember PDT, not just malignancies, it is also used for some other lesions like acne and all but limit ourselves to here with the tumors only. So moving on to the next question. Question number 76. Read it and then we'll do it together. Have you all read it? Yes? 
This is immune mediated reduction or destruction of tissue bearing high concentration of mycobacterium leprous bacilli. Several months after the initiation of effective therapy results in cutaneous ulcers. What is the diagnosis? Reynolds phenomenon no, placebo no, anthrax no. The answer is Lucio phenomena. What actually happens in Lucio phenomena is that there is a high load of M. leprae in the endothelium. So, if there is a high load of M. leprae in the endothelium, once the bacilli kill, they cause vasculitis of the blood vessel. So, once they cause vasculitis, there is ischemia and there is an ulcer. So, there are multiple ulcers, patient is very sick, could be fatal also. So, this is called as Lucio phenomena. What you have to remember about this? You have to remember that it can cause necrotizing vasculitis. This is important. The answer is Lucio phenomena. Right? Clear to everyone? Nothing difficult about it. In leprosy, you have to remember type 1 reaction, type 2 reaction and the Lucio phenomena. Very easy, very simple. Correct? Have you all got it? Good. What is Reynolds phenomena? Reynolds phenomena is generally seen in your systemic sclerosis, in the fingers and toes. There is PCR. When you expose to cold, there is a pallor followed by cyanosis, followed by redness. Okay. So, this is Reynolds phenomena. Placebo phenomena is different. Cutaneous anthrax can also call ulcer, but that is generally solitary. That is called as the malignant pustule not in leprosy. Clear to you? Good. Clear? Clear to everyone? Good. We move on to the next question. Yes. See this image. Question number 3D image, tell me what is there in the image. What does this image show you? Have you all seen the image? Yes. In the image there are multiple hyper pigmented macules present on the cheeks and nose and this is speckled in distribution means dot 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 dot. What is the diagnosis? Tell me the diagnosis multiple hyperpigmented macules present on the cheeks and the nose very 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 common you must have seen it in a lot of women around you, sometimes in the men also, tell me the diagnosis. Tell me the diagnosis, yes? The diagnosis is melasma. The diagnosis is melasma. Melasma is more common in women on the face, on the sun exposed sites. Do you see it? Then what are the causes? There are three main important causes. Most importantly sunlight. Then 
pregnancy then oral contraceptive pills these are the most important causes of melasma most important causes and okay what is the treatment the treatment is sun protection or sunscreens then topical depigmenting agents like hydroquinone as a like acid kojic acid then chemical peels like glycolic acid peels right so this is what you need to know about melasma the image here is a typical image this is what i would have shown you now let's go and read the options is it more common in males no is hydroquinone in your treatment yes can oc pills cause it yes all is true no so false about the following skin condition is this it is more common in females relatively less common in males clear good should we move ahead yes so we move on to question number 78 what does question number 78 talk about question number 78 is talking about nail findings what are the nail findings here the nail finding here is mees line is mees line seen in arsenic poisoning no mees line is seen in lead poisoning is pterygium seen in lichen planus yes this is the most pathognomonic nail finding is onycholysis seen in psoriasis yes is coelunychia seen in megaloblastic anemia no this is seen in oops sorry 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 i uh is colonicia seen in uh this no colonicia is seen in megaloblast no it is seen in iron deficiency anemia so moving on to question number 78 it is a question on the nail what is the wrong match here this is what they are asking so let's go through the matches right mees line arsenic poisoning very correct these are white bands which appear in the nails due to arsenic deposits true pterygium lichen planus true this is rather the most patho gnomic finding in nails of lp onycholysis psoriasis very true happens due to the subungual hk in psoriasis like this is the 
nail in normal people what happens in psoriasis is you have a psoriatic lesion here so what does that psoriatic lesion do that psoriatic lesion lifts your nail plate so here there is onycho lysis happening so this is true so what is the answer here Colonica is seen in iron deficiency anemia, not in megaloblastic anemia. So this is the wrong option. This is not the cause of colonica. The cause is hemol iron deficiency anemia, not this. So the answer here is colonica, right? This is a wrong match moving on to the next question the next question is on dioscopy dioscopy is very helpful in diagnosis of diagnosis of what what is dioscopy dioscopy is a bedside test where you take a glass light press on the lesion to look for a change in the lesion so in case of cutaneous vasculitis when you do dioscopy you will see a non blanchable lesion it will be non blanchable purpura or petechiae in nevus anemicus you will differentiate it from nevus depigmentosis based on dioscopy. In lupus vulgaris, you will see the apple jelly nodules. So, in all these lesions, you will be using dioscopy to diagnose them. So, in all of above, dioscopy is important and it is also important in your port wine stain where it is non blanchable then it is important to differentiate between a petechiae and purpura petechiae will be blanchable this will be non blanchable so dioscopy is helpful in all these conditions you should know what it is very very important rather they will ask you a question on these two findings these two are very important findings right yes which of the following is a photo sensitive disease Which of the following is not a photosensitive disease? Tell me. Do you know what all these options are? Variegate porphyria is a type of porphyria which is photosensitive. Pellagra we had just discussed is photosensitive has this casal necklace sign also. Hydroa astivale is again photo sensitive. Gaucher's disease is a storage disorder. This is not photo sensitive. So variegate porphyria is, pellagra is, hydroa astivale is, this is not clear to you not a difficult question you know that porphyria is photosensitive you know that pellagra is photosensitive 
Hydroa aestivale is photosensitive. Gaucher's is a storage disorder. It will not have any such issues with the sun. Not photosensitive. Clear to everyone? Yes. Then most common malignancy that induces ichthyosis. Tell me. Most common malignancy that produces ichthyosis. Let's go to through ichthyosis once. Ichthyosis can be congenital or it can be acquired. In the congenital, the important ones are ichthyosis, vulgaris, then X-linked recessive ichthyosis, then lamellar ichthyosis. These are the major ones that you need to remember in the acquired causes. The commoner causes are malignancies, then leprosy, then hypothyroidism, and then due to some drugs. What is generally asked to you? They ask you ichthyosis vulgaris. This is autosomal dominant inheritance defect in chromosome 1. This is X-linked recessive inheritance defect in steroid sulfur-tase enzyme. Lamellar ichthyosis, autosomal recessive inheritance, defect in transglutaminase 3 enzyme. In the malignancies, the most common is your Hodgkin's lymphoma. In leprosy, this is due to damage to the sweat glands. In hypothyroidism, this is again due to decreased sweating. In drugs, the most common causes are nicotinic acid, statins and lofer Z mean. These are the most common drug causes of ichthyosis. You are generally asked these congenital ichthyosis very very important then in the acquired malignancy and drugs. These are most commonly asked. Clear to everyone? Good. So what is the answer here? Most common malignancy that produces ichthyosis is Hodgkin's disease. Mycosis fungoides? No. Kaposi sarcoma? No. Carcinoma breast? No. Moving on to the growth phase of hair. Which one is the growth phase of hair? Let's go through hair cycle. In hair cycle there is one phase which is anagen, then you have ketogen, catagen and then you have telogen. Right? This is the growth phase. Last for around 3 to 6 years and around 80 percent of the hair are in anagen phase at any time. The root is black, J or hockey stick shaped. Catagen, this is the regression phase last for around three weeks around one percent of the hair are in catagen phase and the root starts becoming club shaped telogen is the resting phase hair will eventually fall off this will last for three months 
and around 10 to 15 percent of the hair are in this phase at one time. Here the root is depigmented and club shape. Clear to everyone? Yes, no? Clear? Good. Out of which question is asked on this, on this, this and this. Here, this. These are all important questions. You are supposed to know the hair cycle by heart. Clear? Anagen, catagen and telogen. So, what is the answer here? What will be the growth phase of the hair? Growth phase of the hair is the anagen phase. Clear to everyone? Yes. Moving on to the next question, question number 83, primary skin lesions are seen in all except, where are primary skin lesions not seen? readers you have plaques psoriasis you have plaques lichen planus you have papules this is also a plaque but this is a secondary change so bovin's disease is the answer here these are all disorders which have a primary lesion but in bovins, this is happening due to a secondary change. Bovins, it is an erythematous plaque with a shiny surface generally present on the legs. And this is a form of SCC in C2. So, this is SCC in C2. It's a pre-malignant skin lesion. Clear to everyone? Yes, no? Now you also know what Bowen's disease is? Good. This is a pre-malignant skin lesion rather it is SCC in C2. You have to know the most common site which is like you have to know that the plaque is erythematous with irregular borders and a shiny surface. Clear? Bowen's disease. Moving on to question number 84. A long one, read it and then we will discuss it together. Read it. Have you all read it? Good. So now what is this talking about? This is talking about a young boy presents with flaccid bullous lesions, oral mucosal lesions, most likely diagnosis. What does flaccid bully mean? Flaccid bulle in itself gives you the hint that this is a epidermal vesiculobullous disease. Epidermal vesiculobullous disease. Rest of the dermal ones or the subepidermal ones, subepidermal ones have tense blisters. So if it is a flaccid bulla, then this is a epidermal immunobullous disease. Correct? The patient also have oral mucosal lesions. So an epidermal disorder which has oral mucosal lesions, I have no doubt 
mat my diagnosis is pemphigus vulgaris there is absolutely no doubt in pemphigus vulgaris being my diagnosis what is the immunofluorescence on pemphigus vulgaris immunofluorescence on pemphigus vulgaris is fishnet igg in the epidermis this is an autoimmune vesiculobullous disease the antigen here is desmoglein 1 and 3 skin is involved mucosa is involved skin you have flaccid bullae plus erosions plus oral ulcers lesions are more on the upper body what do you get on histopath on histopath you get a supra basal bulla with row of tombstone appearance dif you get the fishnet igg intra epidermal what do you get on zank zank you get acanthocytic cells then the bulla spread and the nikolsky sign is positive this is all that you need to know about pemphigus vulgaris and everything that i've written here is a question fishnet igg acanthocytic cells and bulla spread and nikolsky positive then there is another thing that you have to know the treatment treatment is oral steroids then you can also give azathioprine mycophenolate mofetil and cyclophosphamide in the biologics you can give rituxi map clear in the biologics you can give rituxi map that is all that you need to know about pemphigus vulgaris clear to everybody yes very good so what is the answer here this is the diagnosis of pemphigus vulgaris and in pemphigus vulgaris you see fishnet igg in the epidermis where do you get linear igg deposits linear igg deposits you get in bullous pemphigoid linear ig in the dermal papillae linear iga disease granular iga dermatitis herpetiformis clear to everyone you all know these dif findings are a very very important question please remember it it is most often asked question with regards to vesiculobullous disorders we have already had two of these questions in the uh, swt till now moving on moving on to question number 85 in question number 85 what is the most common pattern of onychomycosis what is onychomycosis tell me what is onychomycosis onychomycosis is dermatophytic plus non dermatophytic plus candidial infection of the nail when we talk about tinea 
anguam then we are talking of only dermatophytic infection of the nail right this is also the most common cause of onychomycosis in which the most common organism is trichophyton rubrum clear to everyone most common organism is trichophyton rubrum now what are the different types there are five main types one that involves this area then number two one that involves this area number three one that involves here four like this and five this now tell me the things this is distal lateral subungual onychomycosis because this is involving the distal and the lateral borders then what is involved this this is proximal subungual onychomycosis this is deeper infection of the nail plate this is endo nix this is the deep infection this is the superficial infection so this is superficial white onychomycosis yeah and this is involving the entire nail so this is total dystrophic onychomycosis td O. Important point to remember in this is that DLSO is the most common form. PSO is seen in those who have <coughs> HIV. Okay. These are the two important things that you have to remember about this. Most common and seen in HIV positive people then what are the findings findings you see sub angle hyperkeratosis plus onycholysis plus nail plate thickening or discoloration this is what you see in onychomycosis. Then you make a KOH smear, you see hyphae. Then you can also culture it, culture it on SDA medium. Then you treat it. How do you treat it? Fluconazole, itraconazole, or turbinafin, or Grisio fulvin. These are the major oral treatments, right? Then topical treatment. In the topical treatment, you have topical ammo, rolfin, and topical cyclopirox, eight percent. 5%. There are some newer drugs which have recently been FBA, FDA approved that is FE, conazole, these are also topical and tobivirol. So these are the newer drugs, these are the otherwise used topical drugs and these are the oral drugs in which itraconazole can be given in pulse form. Clear to everyone? Yes? Good. So in this question here, most common pattern of a nicomycosis is 
distal lateral subungual onychomycosis. This is an HIV. This is superficial infection. This is deep infection of the nail plate. Clear? Good. This is just an image that I have put to tell you that this is how onychomycosis looks like. See nail plate discoloration, blackish discoloration, onycholysis, all this is ON. Then what is this? Simple question, nothing much to read in this. M. leprae generation time 11 to 13 days. This is the generation time, but the disease incubation period can be anything from 2 to 13 years. That is very long. So disease incubation is this, but the generation time is this. Clear? Good. Question number 87. Read this. Tell me. Tell me. In either of these disorders, it can be acquired or it can have autosomal dominant inheritance. The enzyme defect is uroporphyrinogen D carboxylase, right? Then what are the clinical features? Clinical features is intense photosensitivity. Then you have vesicles or rash on exposed sites. which will heal with scarring, cause sclerosis of skin, hypertrichosis of skin and you will actually look like a wolf. So it leads to wolverine faces. Diagnosis is through all those uh, Woods lamp assays and urine porphyrinogen, RBC porphyrinogen, hepatic enzymes. Okay, all these are the ways to diagnose it. Now, what else do you do? You, what is the treatment? Since it's a genetic disorder, there is not much that you can do in the treatment. You have to do repeated phlebotomy to decrease the hepatic iron load then you can also give chloroquine in low dose for long term out of this important are the triggers 
then photosensitivity, then vulvarine facies and then treatment. All these are important things and the fact that this is the most common type of porphyria because it can come even later in life at 40 years of age also you can have it. This is the least common type of porphyria? No, not at all. Decreased activity of uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase? Yes. Prior hep C infection appears to be risk factor? Yes. Treatment consists of repeated phlebotomies? Yes. So all the other things are correct about PCT. Liver disease I already told you is the cause and hep C induced liver disease is a more common cause. So this is an independent risk factor all. So this is the most common type of human porphyria. Clear to everyone? Good. We move on to the next question. Yes. So Blaschko's lines. Blaschko's lines are present along. This is a very important question because you know the dermatomal lines, you know the vascular nevi, you don't that very well know the Blaschko lines. So what exactly are Blaschko lines? These are lines along which the keratinocytes migrate during embryogenesis. So these are actually your lines of development. This is independent of the nerves, lymphatics or vessels. It has no role, no connection to how your arteries move, veins move, lymphatics move or even nerves move. Nerves would be the dermatomal pattern or the zosteriform pattern. Lymphatics is the sporotrichoid pattern but the lines of development is the blaschkoid pattern. This is the pattern along which all the cutaneous nevus come because nevus of keratinocyte will come along this blaschkoid pattern. Clear to everyone? This is an image that I have this is the Blaschko's lines, different uh, different uh, pattern but only thing to remember is there is a midline cut off here, okay? There is a midline cut off, Blaschko's lines. Moving on to question number 89. True regarding Kaposi's sarcoma is all except. So true regarding Kaposi's sarcoma is all except. What is Kaposi's sarcoma? This is a vascular tumor. It is of four types. One, HIV associated. Two, the endemic form. Three, Kaposi sarcoma of immunosuppression. Four, classical case. As the name suggests, this is seen in HIV infection. This is seen in Africa, in children. This is seen in organ transplant or chemotherapy patients. This is seen in elderly, non-immunosuppressed patients. How does it look like? The clinical feature is that of 
purple nodules which are otherwise asymptomatic patient doesn't complain of any itching right cause this is associated with HHV 8 infection and in HIV disease this can happen at any stage irrespective of CD4 count ok and this can involve lymph nodes early in the disease but this is not related to prognosis it has no prognostic relevance clear to everyone yes no this is all that you need to remember about Kaposi sarcoma nothing much in it purple nodules asymptomatic then the histopath you have the channels the vascular endothelial ballooning is there so this is the histopath the clinical feature the lymph node involvement is seen early in the disease not related to the prognosis let us go back to the question so true regarding Kaposi sarcoma is all except may occur in the presence of normal CD4 count yes HHV8 has been strongly implicated yes Sometimes Kobina phenomena may be seen, yes. Lymph node involvement suggests worst prognosis, no. This is not related to the prognosis. So the answer here actually becomes D, right? Clear to everyone? Good. So yes, moving on to the next question. Yes, this is the next question. A female patient who presents with diffuse alopecia, no other significant complaint except that she had suffered from typhoid fever four months back. What is the diagnosis? This is a very easy question. I am sure 100% of you will get it right. There is no doubt in it. 100% of you will get it right. A female who presents with diffuse alopecia, no significant past or present complaint, typhoid fever, what is the most probable diagnosis? Tell me. What is the most probable diagnosis? Let us see. There is something which is called as Effluvium. Effluvium means loss of hair. Now depending on what stage of hair it has affected, it can either be anagen effluvium or it can be telogen effluvium. Anagen effluvium generally happens when there is a sudden arrest of hair growth and they immediately fall off. So patient has a short duration between the trigger and the hair loss. What is the most important trigger? Most important trigger is chemotherapy. You see a patient of chemotherapy, the moment you start chemotherapy, within a few days his hair will start falling because the anchorage of the anagen is suddenly lost, sudden arrest, hair fall off. There is loss of anchorage, immediate fall of hair. In telogen, there are two types of telogen, acute and chronic. So in acute telogen, there is a trigger. What does the trigger do? Trigger causes all the anagen to convert to telogen. So this does not cause loss of anchorage of the anagen. It only causes the anagen to convert to telogen. They will now all the hair will convert to telogen. And as we already read that in three months the telogen hair will fall off. So the patient will have hair fall around 
three to four months after the trigger, not immediately. What are the most important triggers? Most important triggers are a surgery or delivery or a fever. Fever could be a typhoid fever, dengue, chikungunya, anything. So these are the triggers, measles, dengue, chikungunya, typhoid. These are all important sudden systemic illnesses which will lead to this trigger and the patient will have hair fall three months after that fever, not immediately. Here it will be immediate. And chronic telogen effluvium is long term exposure to the trigger will keep converting anogen into telogen and there will be a continuous hair fall. Here the most common triggers are the most common triggers are hypothyroidism and iron deficiency anemia right these are the most common triggers clear to everyone yes good so we come back to the question here a female patient With diffuse alopecia, she has typhoid four years back. What is the diagnosis? Di diagnosis is telogen effluvium. Anogen effluvium we've already read will come with chemotherapy. Alopecia areata will be a patchy hair loss. This is autoimmune in etiology. Anogenetic alopecia will be patterned, not just a diffuse alopecia. This will be patterned at specific location. Here the answer is telogen effluvium. Clear to everyone? Good. And this is self-limiting. Patient will have hair regrowth after the short duration that the hair will fall. Now moving on to the next question. Next question is this, what is idiopathic guttate hypomelanosis? Idiopathic guttate hypomelanosis. This is, you must not have heard of it. It is a relatively common condition like it is so common that you put five elderly people in front of me and at least two of them Rather, three of them might also have it on their legs. It is that common. What is this? This is actually porcelain white depressed macules that appear on the anterior surface of legs and forearms in elderly patients mostly. They are idiopathic no cause and they cause no harm to the patient. So in idiopathic guttate hypomelanosis the treatment is there is no treatment as we have already read this is seen here because it has some relation to solar damage. Clear to everyone? Yes. Moving on to the next question. Moving on to the next question. So moving on to the next question. Question number 92. Shawl sign is seen in. Shawl sign is seen in. Which of these? A very simple question but a very important question. This is seen in something which is called as dermato myositis right this is seen in dermato myositis what do you have in this you have skin rash plus 
muscle inflammation. So, you have skin rash, muscle inflammation. What are the skin rashes? You have photosensitivity, heliotrope rash, Gautrin's papules, Gautrin erythema, Shawl sign, Holster sign, and Calcinosis cutis with Periungual telangiectasias and poikiloderma. Everything that I have written here is a question with regards to dermatomyositis. I even more than SLE, more than SLE, more than systemic sclerosis, they will ask you questions on dermatomyositis. They are so fond of this particular disorder. Every, every, every cutaneous aspect here is a question. Heliotrope sign, I have images of these, I will show you. This is seen around the eye. Papule is seen on the interphalangeal joints. Erythema is again seen on the hands. Shawl sign is seen on the back and arm in the distribution of you wearing a shawl. Holster is seen in the lateral you know those old times that revolver they used to put in a band so where the revolver sets which is the lateral thigh and the flank it is holster sign calcinosis cutis are whitish nodules which are again seen on the joints periangal telangiectasia as the name suggests is seen on the nail poikiloderma is seen on the skin this is erythema plus pigmentation plus telangiectasia. So these are the findings of dermatomyositis. All the cutaneous features, muscle, what do you see? You see symmetrical, bilateral, proximal, myopathy with muscle. So the patient can't do this, patient can't get up from a sitting position like you have the gower sign, you have something similar to that here also. So this is all about what you find in dermatomyositis. Clear to everyone? Should I move to the images? See these images. This is your Gautrin's papules. These are the papules which are present on the interphalangeal joints. Then this is the shawl sign that is asked in the question. These are all other photosensitivity rashes. And this is periorbital erythema and edema. This is the periorbital erythema and edema. What was this sign? We have just read this. This is your heliotrope rash. Very, very important question. Very commonly asked. Heliotrope rash. Then, do you see this linear erythema? This is the Gautrin's erythema. This is again linear erythema. Gautrin's erythema. In the muscle, I already told you, then you have the serology you have the anti jo antibody anti pl7 anti pl12 and basically anti muscle antibodies all of these then you also have muscle enzymes like creatine and kinase which are high then the diagnostic criteria, the diagnostic criteria are called as 
Bohan and Peter criteria. You don't need to know what is there in it. You just need to know Bohan and Peter criteria. Then how else do you make a diagnosis? You can do muscle biopsy, EMG, then muscle ultrasound and MRI. These will all show evidence of muscle inflammation. Then you can do skin biopsy and DIF. How will you treat? You will treat with steroids plus HCQS. Everything that I have written on this page is a question. Everything that I have written here is a question. This is asked, this is asked and this is asked. These are all important things. Clear to everyone, dermatomyositis is actually the most important connected tissue disease with respect to questions on it. Right? So we move on to the next question, question number 93. This is incontinentia pigmenti. What is incontinentia pigmenti? Incontinentia pigmenti is a genodermatosis, X-linked, dominant inheritance. So it is lethal in males. Patients are all females. Then the gene which is involved in this is the Nemo gene. This can involve skin plus CNS plus eye. Okay? This can involve skin, CNS and eye. And in the skin, you initially have vesicular lesions. Then these become verrucous. Then these become hyperpigmented and then these become hypopigmented. So this is how the lesions appear. Vesicular, verrucous, hyperpigmented, hypopigmented and all of these are present along the Blaschko lines. Clear? Very easy. Very easy to remember. But again, every line that I have written here, they ask about incontinentia pigmenti. This is actually a favorite. Since its inheritance is a little uncommon, they are probably quite fond of it. So let's come back to the question. Incontinentia pigmenti associated with X-link dominant? Yes. Linear hyperpigmented? Yes. Eye problems? Yes. But do all patients have eye problems? No. Only a few have eye problems. Others can live mostly an uneventful life except for their skin lesions. So this is incontinentia pigmenti. Important to remember this, this and this. Clear to you? I have some images to show. See, these are the linear hyperpigmented lesions which are present along the lines. There is a midline cutoff. I told you that in blaschoid lesions there is a midline cutoff. Here also there is a midline cutoff. This is incontinentia pigmenti. There is no cure for it. Maybe in future there might be gene therapy. As of now, there is nothing we can do for these patients. Moving on to the next question. Scleridema is associated with. What is scleridema associated with? Tell me. You all will be very tempted to mark this, right? We have all read of scleroderma, scleroderma. Oh, maybe these people have made a spelling mistake. They were actually wanting to write scleroderma. So scleroderma is PSS. But no, this is not a spelling mistake. This is actually scleridema. What this is, this is scleroderma. This is scleridema. This is 
also binding down of skin but this is binding down of skin different from that this is scleroderma most important causes is diabetes then streptococcal infection then there are multiple other causes if you call it scleroderma good enough but you can also call it pseudo scleroderma because this looks like scleroderma but this is not actually scleroderma scleroderma is the systemic form the autoimmune disease here only skin is involved there is no systemic involvement so this is scleroderma when it is associated with diabetes then it is called as scleroderma diabeticorum clear to everyone a difficult question since you don't read it that commonly but i'm sure you can manage now moving on to the next question true about stratum lucidum is very important stratum lucidum you have five layers in the epidermis stratum basale stratum spinosum granulosum lucidum and stratum corneum out of which basale is the other name is germinated one germinative one this actually divides to form all the rest layers this is the prickle cell layer this is the granular layer this is rich in keratohyaline granules and odlent bodies this is only present in palms and soles corneum is the dead layer it is a nucleate and it is the last layer to form so these are some important points about all these layers out of which our question regards to stratum lucidum so as you see this is sandwiched between these two so this is sandwiched between stratum so is this sandwiched between spinosum and granulosum no does this contain degenerated cells yes because this is actually a transition from the living cells in the stratum granulosum to absolutely dead cells in the stratum corneum so these are actually transitional cells from living to non living these contain hair follicle no prickle cell no that is stratum spinosum so the answer here is this clear to you all yes good very important because they actually confuse you between the sandwiching layers moving on to the next question zank cell what actually is a zank cell what is a zank cell zank smear is generally made in disorders which are containing vesicles and bullae when you make it in the pemphigus group of disorder the acantholytic cells are seen in it when you make it from the herpes or the varicella group of disorder then you see multinucleate giant cells 
So when you see it in the pemphigus, you see the cantalytic cells. When you see in the herpes, then you see multinucleate giant cells. What is the stain that is used here? Stain used is Jim's smear. <coughs> Clear to you? Now I have an image I will show you. See, this is the Zang smear of the pemphigus vulgaris. These are called as acantholytic cells which are also called as Zang cells. These otherwise a squam in the skin is like this. When it separates from different cell it attains the configuration of the lowest surface tension so it becomes round. These cells are round with a large nucleus. These are your acantholytic or Zang cells. Where are these derived from? They are derived from the epidermal cells. So what actually are the epidermal cells? Epidermal cells are actually your keratinocytes. So your Zang cells are actually keratinocytes. These are seen in the pemphigus group of disorder. There is a vesicle. You rupture the vesicle, scrape the base, put it on a slide, stain with Jemsa, look in the microscope. So what do you look in the microscope? You look for acantholytic cells. These are the separated keratinocytes which were floating in the vesicle. Although these are acantholytic cells, although these are Zang cells, but what are they actually? They are actually derived from the stratum spinosum. They are keratinocytes. Clear to you? Yes. Then I told you the herpes. In the herpetic infections, also you make a Zang smear. There what you see is multinucleate giant cells. This is also a very important question. Always remember in genital herpes, oral herpes or chicken pox or herpes zoster, you do a Zang smear, you look for multinucleate giant cells. Clear? This is a type of cytology. It is a type of cytology smear that is also asked. You are studying the cells. Then what is the normal turnover rate of the epidermis? What is the normal turnover rate of the epidermis? Normal turnover rate of the epidermis is 4 weeks. Normal turnover rate is 4 weeks. If they ask you in range, then 4 to 5 weeks. If they ask you in days, 28 days. Range would be 28 to 30 days. This is the time taken from the stratum base cell to move to stratum corneum and then shed off. This is epidermal turnover time. Then there is another time which is called as the generation time or the cell cycle time. This is the time taken from one cell to divide to two cells. This is generally 36 hours in the skin. These are your stratum basal cells. So this is normally 36 hours. But if there is psoriasis, then in psoriasis, this turnover rate becomes 4 days. Means within 4 days, cell moves through all these cycles. Oh, sorry. Here, please correct this. Normally, it takes 311 hours to generate one cell from the other. Right? But if it is psoriasis, then it takes 36 hours for the cell to divide from one to another. This is how rapidly the infection, infection getting. This is how rapidly the cells divide in psoriasis. That is why they go so rapidly up, up, up. There is disordered keratinization. There are nucleated cells still in the stratum corneum. There is not enough time to let the nucleus die. 
So you get parakeratosis and you get such amount of scaling because the cells are rapidly coming up. Please remember this is an important question. Some books mention 8 weeks but 8 weeks is not the answer. The answer is 4 weeks. Do not confuse between this. Right? Good. Question number 98. Wow! We are reaching the end of this SWT. All of the following statements are true about the disease where the following rash is noted. Look at the image. See what the image shows you. Tell me what the image shows you. Image shows you that on bilateral cheeks there is erythema and the patient is a child of course. These are the two things that you catch from the image. Question there is no hint at all. So look at the image again. What does it look like? What does this erythema look like? This looks as if somebody has slapped the baby. So this is the slapped cheek appearance. Slapped cheek appearance. Okay? Where is slapped cheek appearance seen in? Slapped cheek appearance is seen in a disease which is called as erythema infectious awesome. This is caused by parvovirus B19. This is also called as the fifth disease. In this the patient initially has fever, malaise, then after some days there is this slap cheek appearance means there is a rash on the face and then after that you have a racy lacy reticulate rash on the trunk right fever malaise slap cheek appearance lacy reticulate rash on the trunk. Alright? It is a self-limiting disorder. You need to do nothing to treat it. This is all that you have to remember about erythema infectious awesome. So when we come to this question Slap cheek we have already seen, we already know that this is erythema infectiosum, we already know it is caused by parvovirus B19, reticulate lazy exanthem may be noted on the trunk in the extremities, they are seen in healthy individuals. It is not this, this is not the answer, roseola infantum is different, okay, roseola infantum is a different disease. This is actually caused by HHV6 and this is the sixth disease, right? This is the sixth disease. Moving on to the next question, question number 99. Identify the procedures shown in the illustration. What does this image show you? See what it shows you. This shows you a scalpel. Right? This shows you a scalpel along with a elliptical excision. So it is showing you a elliptical excision biopsy of this lesion in the center. So what is the diagnosis? The diagnosis is excisional biopsy, right? What will be endoscopic biopsy? Endoscopic biopsy will be you put an endoscope inside and then you take a probe and a biopsy. 
what will be core cut biopsy core cut biopsy is like this generally a cylindrical punch goes inside takes out the core from the center of the lesion fine needle aspiration is through a needle put the needle aspirate but when you are removing the entire lesion then it is called as excision biopsy clear good last question I am sure all of you will be very happy if at all you reach the last question in the video right so look at the image here tell me the diagnosis we've talked about it pretty much throughout the discussion what do you see in the nail here you see that there is total loss of nail there is no nail and you see this wing shaped structure you see this wing shaped structure total nail loss plus pterygium total nail loss plus pterygium what is the diagnosis diagnosis is lichen planus characteristic we've discussed it pretty much pterygium complete irreversible loss of nail happening in lichen planus called as pterygium wing shaped extension of the nail bed onto nail fold onto the nail bed damages there is no space for nail completely lost this is called as pterygium seen in LP I am sure I have been successful in explaining all the basics to you as well as the tougher things still in case you have any doubts you can get back to me on this email ID I am pretty uh, fast if you call that two three days I am pretty fast at responding to the email any doubts do get back to me all the best for your upcoming exams aims and pgi are around the corner all the best do well i'm sure you all can rock it thank you so much